Hi, this is Bryant with Slam, and on this week's Slam Presents, we speak with Brian Mackey of Antler Creek Wildlife Creations. And Brian is a craftsman who uses a lot of natural material to create some incredible home furnishings and some other interesting objects. So Brian, how did you first get into using antlers as a medium, and when did you understand that you were an artist? Um, a long time ago, back when I was in college, I was picking up a lot of antlers, and I was actually doing some taxidermy at the time, and then um, started seeing a few other people starting to build some things with antlers, and and it's kind of like, you know what, I can do that. Um, instead of, I basically was selling all my antlers um, to go overseas for aphrodisiacs, and you know, getting ground up, and I was kind of like, you know, I'd like to see something made with those, and uh, so I started building stuff, and pretty, you know, just took off from there, and. Just, I did it as a hobby for a long time, it's just selling stuff on the side, and then uh, finally grew into a full-time business. Were you always a crafty, artistic kid? Yeah, yeah. My dad, I worked with my dad a lot. You know, he built stuff. Um, I actually built this house. I, you know, I've, I've always, you know, rebuilt motors. It's, it's, you know, always worked with my hands and have always been good at, you know, making things. So. When did you understand you were an artist? Um... You know, I took art classes way back when I was a kid. Um, I always liked to draw, and so I, I think I've always been somewhat artistic. I've never really got into it, you know, hardcore. You know, I th actually thought about it in school, but I thought, you know, you can't make any money being an artist, and so I didn't, uh, you know, graduate in that. But, I, you know, looking back, it, it might not have been a bad idea, I, you know, just thinking, because it, it's, you know, it's not about the money anymore, and um, but um, yeah, it might have taught you some of the skills that helped you. You just had to find the right medium. Right, right. So you were going out in the woods, probably since you were a little kid, right? Yep, yep. And were you just collecting antlers? Um, yeah, I always loved picking them up, and I had not, you know, good eyes to spot them. Um, it was always fun. Yeah, so I, yeah, I spent a lot of time in the woods. I still, you know, that's a big part of this is I love getting out and. You know, you don't have a bad day in the woods, really. So. How did you find out that you could sell antlers? Um, just they make unique, you know, functional items. and, and Well, even yeah. before that, you said you're selling Oh, okay, because, you know, there was a market for, you know, picking them up and selling by the pound to ship overseas. So, we we're, you know, I was making some money with that. Actually, pretty good money doing that. But then, you know, I was like, you know, these are just all getting ground up and I'd, I'd like to, you know, build something with them and, and, and there, there, you know, became a market for chandeliers and lamps and candle holders and knickknacks and, you know. So what was the stuff. first item that you built? Um, first thing I built was a table, a big coffee table for, uh, that I sold to a, a guy that, uh, worked with me. And what kind of antler or what kind of it was, uh, material did you use? It was elk, white elk antlers and it was like put a round 48 inch glass on it and um, you know it was actually a, yeah, a neat looking table. <laughs> I think I sold it for 500 bucks so. And you knew right then that it was like. Yeah and after that it was like yeah I said I can I can start making stuff and then um, yeah it, it kind of took off from there. And then you had been collecting antlers for a while, but were you selling them all, or did you have a stockpile to start? And once you made that table, you're like, I have all this material. No, I, I was you selling them, and so I had to, you know, I kind of started from scratch as far as, so I just started keeping the antlers I found after that point, so. Do you kind of do a production style where it's like, or assembly line where I'm going to go out and I'm going to spend this much as gathering materials and then spend this time building or do you just go find stuff and start building and it's just kind of interwoven? You know, I buy 90% of the antlers I use from other guys that pick because I go through too many antlers. So I, I do love picking them up and I, um, some of the bigger ones I'll keep and hang. I've got, you know, some over here on the wall. Um, and uh, so I, I've kept some of the bigger ones or unique ones, but uh, it's, you know, I'll pick an antler up and it's like, oh, that's going to be a perfect candle holder. Or I find a you know set and it's like oh this you know this is gonna work good for a lamp and yeah do you see like, that right away oh, yeah. in the while yeah. you look yeah. at it and you kind of know now exactly what it's gonna be pretty much yeah how long do you think that took you before you had that eye to understand what object it would make um probably when I 
needed to buy antlers as soon as I was like, you know, having to buy them from somebody else. I was like, you know, I need, I need antlers for this and that. And I, you know, I, and I use all the scraps now. I, I've got boxes of scraps I use for, I've tried to, um, come up with stuff to use all the pieces that, you know, I've got sitting around. So I bet that was like the next evolution for you as a craft and where you were going out grabbing stuff and then building it. You realize like all my time needs to be building so I could just outsource the collection. Yeah, it, it, it's way more efficient for me just to buy antlers and then it is to uh, go out and pick them. But the picking part is a fun part. So it's uh, time well spent. <laughs> Do you have an antler that like or a type of antler? that you enjoy working with the most? Um, no, but you know, moose are really unique. I, I've made some moose coffee tables and moose lamps and they, they really come out cool. And they're, they're a little tricky to work with cause they're a big paddle, but I've kind of figured out how to put them together and they're definitely make something unique. But it's so, the shape, the fact that you have a little bit of a bigger antler, more width, makes it more unique in what you can do with it. Yeah, you know, let me just grab this one here. Right? Great. So I found this last winter as hunting elk up Kelly Canyon and uh, came across the moose antler. So it was uh, kind of an extra bonus. But um, so, yeah, they're, they're pretty u unique. But this would make like the base for a, a big lamp. Um, or I've... Um, you know, sitting down like this and then adding another antler up here, or a guy can take it and, you know, put it in a chandelier or, or a coffee table because you can actually sit them like this where you can, you know, you, sometimes you have to trim the points down, but it'll sit a, you know, piece of glass on top of it. So, and they're, they're super solid. They're, you know, the, the base is just super dense material and they're, they're super strong. So it's, uh, you know, they're kind of, kind of unique that way. How important is it to find its matching set, or are the antlers sometimes interchangeable enough that you could get away with two antlers from different animals? They are interchangeable enough. Um, it's I love finding that. I looked, I went back a couple times. I could not find the other side to this guy, and so it, uh, you know, I'm hoping to find it again this winter after it turns white and they stick out a little bit more. Um, but no, you know, and deer are so similar. And elk the same way. They're, they're all, you know, they grow real similar that I can uh, com combine different antlers and I kind of know how, you know, they're going to fit together. And But do kind of the actual set fit together the best? Yes, it's, it's fun to make a set like with a lamp where I've got, you know, one side is down and the other antlers up and it's like, you know, they're, they're matching. It's, it is kind of fun. When that. you find one antler, is it usually that the other antler will be somewhere in the area or is it just random chance you know typically if on a bigger bull they'll be within on deer or elk and moose anyway within 100 yards of each other if you don't find them that close you're probably not going to find them because then it means it stayed on his head for another day or two and they cover a lot of ground so um but usually when one goes the other one is pretty close. pretty close yeah i found them right on top of each other actually so and, and even with deer, you find them, sometimes you find them side by side, so it, you, you just never know. But uh, it's it's fun when you find a pair. What makes a great antler when you see it? Is it size? Is it density? Is it the number of points? Um, You know, they're all great. <laughs> it's, it's, sometimes it's the way they're laying. Um, size is always unique. If you, you know, you find a whopper or something with extra points on it or, um, you know, it's, they're, but, but it's all exciting, even the little ones, like, you know, it's like, oh, there it is, you know. And, <laughs> and you see it, and right away in your mind, you're like, there's there's the candle holder. Some, yeah, there's sometimes, yeah, holder. yeah. So, I mean, this one just looks good sitting on my fireplace, too, so I kind of, I kind of like that, too, with some of them. Yeah, you have such a cool material, because even in its raw state, it's yeah. like an art piece itself. Exactly, yeah, it just makes great decoration just the way it is, so, yeah, it's fun. What are the, what is your best seller? Is it moose? Is it elk? Is it deer? Um, you know, the best sellers are just little things, um, bottle openers, ice cream scoops, uh, small candle holders. I sell a lot of that stuff. Um, the, you know, some summers lamps sell really good. Um, other times it's candle holders. Um, you know, and every, then I mix a few big chandeliers in here and there and some floor lamps, uh, a little bit of everything, but 
you know, the small stuff, I, I do a lot of small stuff where you're just taking the tine off a, you know, elk antler or an elk, you know, just part of the, part of the antler to make a handle for something or, you know, I make, uh, no, I actually don't have drawer pulls like on the console there, you know, things like that. I do a lot of that stuff. So it has like a handle and it's part and it's not an individual piece. Do you think yeah. people just like the feel of the antler? It's kind you of... know, I think it's just unique. It looks, it goes good with a lot of stuff and it's got, each one's got its own shape and size and color sometimes. That Especially it's... for souvenirs, it really fits yeah. the Western aesthetic. You can't yeah, yeah, it, you it looks away. good with that, you know, barn wood, uh, with logs. It um, And it even goes good with some modern stuff too. So, you know, you can kind of fit it in almost anywhere. And I mean, that's great for you because it's like no waste. Yeah. You can make yeah. this big thing, but then if like a single tine is in the way, you just cut it down yeah. and it becomes something else. Right. And you do, there is a lot of antlers with broken tines. I mean, these critters fight a lot in the woods and I mean, it's, it's rough life out there and they, uh, so, you know, you get a antler that's broken up, I can still cut it into pieces and, you know, make salt and pepper shaker or a, you know, knife handle or, you know, a lot of. So no waste yeah. material. That's super Pretty cool. much. Yeah. How many of the pieces do you create are custom order versus you decide? Um, probably maybe ten percent or something. I, I get it. I do get some custom orders, uh, you know, fairly often. So it's you know it's it's fun to do, and it's actually I I enjoy when people have their own antlers. They've got a collection of deer they've shot over the years, or they picked up a couple of sheds and they want something made, and so it's kind of a little bit of a challenge to take what they have and you know make something. But I can usually you know, fit them together and come up with something. What's the most complicated thing that you make? Is that a chandelier? Probably a chandelier. Because then you've got to drill the inside of the antler. Um, you got to get them balanced, uh, you know, run your wires. It's, uh, you know, something Do you do the electric part of that too, or you yeah. just set the frame? No, I do all the electric stuff. Yeah, it's, it's really simple wiring. So it's just a matter of getting your wires through the antler and out to, you know, your lights and and making sure that the wires can't be seen, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, I, everything's hidden. How heavy are those? Um, you know, I make a pretty good size elk chandelier that only weighs fifty pounds. I mean, a typical big elk antler weighs from, you know, six to eight pounds. I mean, I I've had some up, you know, to fifteen, but or sixteen, but most of them are, you know, six to eight. So if you put, you know, ten antlers in a chandelier, at, you know, six to eight pounds a piece, you're, you know, sixty to eighty pounds. So and what have you learned over the years working with antlers? Is there any like special secrets that have developed or just the way you handle it? Or um, You know, there really isn't. Um, it's the, I've got some pretty good techniques for bonding and, you know, putting them together to, you know, hold tight. Um, it's just a lot of drilling and, um, you know, drilling in the right spot. And, uh, you know, there's... there's you know, over there's, the years too, you learned where the pieces actually interconnect and like how to counterbalance. Yep. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So there's really no secrets. It's just hard work, you know, just playing with it, playing with it and get them. Like I said, with the things you got to have, you know, touching in three places. So it's like a tripod, it, you know, sturdy, um, you know, there's, yeah, there's no real, you know, secret as far, you know, people ask, do you have a curved bit for going around the corner? I'm like, no, there, there's no such thing. And people, but there's guys out there that'll tell it, you know, some of them ask them, how do you drill that? And they say, well, I've got a special bit. And it's like, no, they don't. Just, just throwing them off? Throwing yeah, them off they're the trying same. to throw you off. And I, you know, I, I've never done that. I'm like, you know, if you want to try it, you're, you know, welcome. And I'll tell you how to do it. It's just. Yeah, what makes you know, your special is the craftsmanship yeah, behind it. Yeah. And, and that took years to develop. It's not something someone who's a hobbyist is going to do once. Yeah. I'm like, oh. So I'm not worried about, you know, and if they want to try it and they, you know, like I say, I've, I've got some good friends that I've shown how to do antler art and we've become really good friends you know basically people i've met over the phone and now i go hunting with them and you know spend time with them and you even have some youtube videos right yes yep and where could people find those tutorials um i think if you just look under antler creek on youtube um i've got a couple on finding antlers uh i got one about how to make a cribbage board out of a moose antler and then also uh how to put a candle holder together so I think there should be four out there if you look hard enough. So you just turn this into a cribbage board? Yeah, if this would be a, a big cribbage board here, actually this would make a really good whopper cribbage board, but I would drill, you know, one group of holes down this side and one down this side. Um, 
High yeah. school, my yeah. uncle taught me how to play cribbage. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I played a lot in college, and I, I do sell a lot of cribbage boards. I just sold uh, actually this past Christmas a couple of them this last yeah, it's week. Yeah, such a unique gift. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought that you would make yeah. a game board out of an antler. Yeah, this would be a little bit big, but you know, there's people that have a huge coffee table, or you know, they want something that big. So you just uh, never never know. So other like on the lines of a cribbage board, what do you think is the most unusual item you've made out of an antler? <laughs> Maybe some uh, back, like a back scratcher or something. You know, a little antler handle with a, actually with a like a weird three tipped antler that you know looked like a hand or fingers, and you know I turned it into a back scratcher. So you know, and where do you think those ideas come from? It's just the shape of the antler. You're kind of sitting around, it, it like, is, you know, what might be fun. It is the shape of the antler. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, they they're all unique and. Um, so it's kind of fun that way. And have you ever been really surprised how something like that came out? You're like, well, this actually really works. Or yeah, um, maybe it doesn't work. No, you know, most of the time it works and it's, it, you know, and somebody will buy it. <laughs> so. And then if someone buys it, it's time to make round two, right? Well, yeah, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you sit on those things for a long time, but uh, yeah, you, you never know. It's, yeah. And you were talking about that you have the YouTube video and you've actually developed friendships over being able to share that knowledge. So if somebody was interested in trying to turn an antler they found into a candle holder or some other item, what's one piece of advice you could give to somebody looking to craft their own creation? Um, just call. <laughs> just call. <laughs> yeah. Or come by. Yeah. Cause I, I'll, I'm glad to help anybody. That is great. Uh, that's, yeah. that's an awesome yeah. asker. So guys, if you guys have questions, you could contact Brian and they could find your contact info on your website. Right? Yep. Antlercreek.com. Um, Cool. Thank yeah. you. Um, now let's talk about after you've created them, how do you sell your antlers? Um, I've got my website, uh, which does rather well. Um, I do markets in the summer, like the, the Bozeman Farmer's Market, uh, Big Sky Farmer's Market, and then Slam is always a good venue. Um, and then I've done some traveling with the... Uh, the Elk Foundation does a show in conjunction with Cowboy Christmas in Vegas. It's a 10-day show that that's good. I used to actually do the log home circuit. They had log home shows that um, did everything to do with building a log home, and that was always a good market. So um, I just kind of cut back on the traveling a little bit, and so I've, I've done, you know, the Slams local, which is nice, and then Cowboy Christmas is the one I travel for, so... Do you think you do better with a tourist market or a homeowner market? Um, here, like a local home. You know, the the Big Sky market's good with all the homes going up. Um, it's really good. Uh, and but the tur well, and part of that is tourist market up there. Actually, I I would say the majority of that market is tourists. Um, yeah, people rent their houses, and when people come yeah. out here and have a mountain cabin, they're expecting yeah. to see the yeah. classic west western aesthetic. Yeah, and so. Um, you know, it, it's all good. Um, you know, and people love taking a antler handled ice cream scoop home or a pizza cutter or a bottle opener. And that's what you sell a lot at the farmers yeah, markets. Yeah, little stuff. And then, um, and there's you know lamps and cribbage boards and candle holders and you know a little bit of everything. More than knickknacks versus the bigger sculptures. Yeah, yeah, the chandeliers. You know, like I say, a few of those every now and then, but. Um, you know, a lot of the little stuff. And for those, are you primarily selling those to interior designers or direct to homeowners? Um, a little bit of both. I, I do have a couple designers that, you know, they love to put them in a house they're doing. It, at least, you know, like I say, they don't want to do it all antler, but they like one or two antler pieces in a, you know, any kind of mountain, mountain home. And did you seek out those partnerships or they just kind of developed naturally? You know, Somebody I, I, saw your work and then realized when they were looking they could come contact you? A little bit of both. You know, it's it's like just having the right, you know, knowing people and getting your name out there. And um, so, yeah, let's just take it as it comes as far as running into them and finding the, the right connection and so and making good connections. And for those shows, what's one piece of advice you could give to any artist looking to sell at a market? Um, I guess a nice presentation and having a variety of um, variety of things because you never know. Some 
some summers I sell a lot of lamps, other summers I don't sell a lamp and I sell a ton of candle holders. It's just, so you kind of have to have a variety and, you know, figure out what people like. Yeah, and pay attention, yeah. especially if it's a weekly thing, what it's actually selling so you can have more of that, yeah. you can have it more prominently placed. And the little stuff, help. I mean, you got to have affordable stuff, you know, from five to, you know, $50 kind of things that anybody that wants it can buy it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I do have a bunch of high-end stuff that you know, only certain people can buy, but it's... Um, but aim for the cycle. You have a few yeah. home runs, but have a few singles. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You got to get no hit. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you go home with a little bit of success, and then if you sell a huge piece, it's like more power to you, but right. you're not relying on this one huge right. swing. Yeah. And I've seen people have a booth or whatever and just have a big chandelier for sale. And it's like, dude, you're, you know... You're going to spend four days of this show and go home, you know, empty-handed. And they, they usually do. Well, yeah, and then it's like the pressure of mountains. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have anything that, like, any kind of momentum. You're just probably, right. like, sitting there getting gloomier and gloomier as it's, right. like, harder right. and harder to sell. No, it's it's, it's nice. The little stuff piece. pays the gas bills and the, you know, because there's expenses. And, you know, gas, motel, time. It's, so... All the animals that you craft, antlers and stuff, are they all native to Montana? Or do you craft any material that's from anywhere else in the United States or anywhere else in the world? Um, I've done a few uh, custom things with like axis deer where people actually have their own. You know, some came from Hawaii. Um, another, some things out of Texas. I've done some kudu that, um, you know, are kind of a unique horn that I've done some stuff with. Um, but it's pretty much... You know, moose, elk, deer. When you so. work with those foreign antlers, is there any? Is it much different, or is it just different in how they may sit together? But the material yeah. itself, it's is all the same. It's just it's with. how they they hook together, and it's but it's all the same technique. So once you figure out how to hook stuff together, and for you when you're it. crafting and you're actually touching the antler, do they feel different, or if you close your eyes, other than the shape itself, do the antlers all? feel the same not really no they're they're a little different they're um yeah they're they vary a little bit uh but in the end it's it's all just figuring out how to put them together and you know what you want to make with them do you have any dream material you have yet to use that you're hoping you get a chance to craft not really um i got some you know like i said i've got more ideas in my head than i've got some wire projects and some things like that that i want to do with um, I'm going to try to work on a bighorn sheep this week, a life size with wire. So, and then if I, I want to do a horse too, cause you know, it's the, my barbed wire stuff lends itself to that. So it's my wire sculptures. So you were doing antlers for a long time and now recently you've also started to extend the materials you've craft, right? Yeah. How long have you been experimenting with other materials and what are those other materials? You know, I, um, I've been doing a lot of barbed wire stuff. I started it probably... 15 years ago maybe and yeah and and it's a black you know it's fun to work with because there's such a wide variety of wire and there's so much used wire out there that it's uh you know there's endless material and it's free you know it's it's just and you're cleaning up the stuff that could be dangerous which is well really and, and it's just it just sits out there and it gets you know but there's galvanized there's really rusty red there's black stuff you know it's just really unique um so I got into that and it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, you can make, you know, and it, there's a wide variety of critter. I mean, and all the detail you can put in with wires, it's really, it's really fun. Do you so, ever use wire and antler? No, I haven't. <laughs> no, they've always kind of been separate. Yeah, I, I've kind of kept them separate. I've used uh, wire with uh, some metal, you know, as far as like silhouettes. I could do a bison skull that's uh, metal. The skull part's metal and the horns are wire, which they, you know, they go together well. What made you start experimenting in wire? Were you out in nature and you found it and you're like, well, maybe I could do something with this? I think it was the same thing as the antlers. It, you know, antlers are like the ultimate renewable resource. They just, they grow them every year and shed them. So you, there's an endless supply as long as you're there to pick them up. Um, and the wire was like, it was the same thing to me. It's like, there's so much of the wire out there that, you know, I... I think I can make some cool stuff with and I started you know and it's yeah it's I've made some you know it's it's just fun to work with 
Was that a hard transition at first, having worked with Antler for so long, all of a sudden switching over to a metal? No, it's just another, it's like going from painting to sculpting or, you know, and I do like to draw, and but I just don't have the, don't do as much as I'd like, um, you know, it, it just, um, no, it wasn't, wasn't hard at all, it's just another medium. Well, imagine with these, it's like you have them, you kind of see how, and you could more experiment with how they fit together. When you're taking that wire and you're making a bison head or a different mm -hmm. sculpture, are you drawing that out at all, or are you just starting to play with it and see? No, what I, I just look at a picture. I um, because I actually I did a moose skull and rack with uh, wire one time. <laughs> I came on neat, so I just um, I just look at photos and I just try to get everything right proportionally, and then with the wire, I try to pick up all the characteristics of a. Like kind of pheasant with the you know the wattles and the you know the tail feathers and you know variation of color i try to mix galvanized in there to you know highlight some of the features and you decide ahead of time what it is you're looking to ultimately create and then you start yeah. finding the metals that match yep yeah yep so yeah it's kind of and it's it's there's enough unique wire out there there's you know, it's kind of fun to mix a wire together and see what you can come up with. When you're working with barbed wire, do you have to be extra careful? Or are you like uh, shaving down some of the spikes so it's not as no, sharp? It's, yeah, I, I get cut a lot. <laughs> I wear good gloves, but the wire snaps around. You know, it's, it's got a lot of um, spring to it. So you'll be winding something that will hit you or hit you in the leg. You know, I get, I'm up on my tetanus shot <laughs> that way. So. It's, you get, you get cuts, when you're yeah. working with wire versus you, when you're working with antler. Yeah, you definitely you get cuts and scrapes. There's no doubt about it. It's you know it's kind of nasty stuff, but it's uh, you just gotta be careful though. I got good gloves, just fencing gloves. So. But I guess that's a mark of uh, how you truly love the material. Yeah. If you take a few yeah. scrapes and you no, still... you, you definitely get a few scrapes. Yeah. What's yeah. one piece of advice you give to anybody who's trying to work with wire for the first time? Um, good gloves. Good gloves. Yeah, basically, you just need uh, good gloves, a pair of uh, good needle nose pliers, and some fencing pliers. Do you heat the metal to bend it, or is no. it just no? It, it all bends. Sometimes it's uh, can get a little brittle. Older stuff, uh, real old stuff, can be brittle sometimes. Um, have you had anything just snap? On oh you? yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's frustrating. Rough. It's like you're almost there yeah, you're almost sudden. done. And um, but usually I can just you know add another piece on and keep winding or do whatever I'm doing with it. So, yeah. And so now, are you enjoying working more with wire because it's newer, or do you still enjoy working more with antler? Um, I like them both. It's, um, you know, the wire thing is you kind of almost have to switch your modes in my shop, where I, although I do it more in my main part of my garage because it takes up a little more space, but I do kind of get into it where I'll do a bunch of wire stuff and then jump back in and do some antler stuff. And but you probably have to segment. It's not like you're going piece to piece. It's like, I'm going to do, spend this long doing wire. Yeah. This long doing antler. Like I'll do, um, if I get all the wire out, I'll do, I'll make like three pheasants or this summer I made, you know, I think three or four pairs of uh, Sandhill cranes, which was big projects, but they came out really cool. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of did them all at once. And, and then when you go and you take these to sell at your booth, do you have a mix of both or do you sometimes segment it that you only have your wire? And sometimes I do know. actually at Big Sky set up both and um but the up there the uh, antler tends to sell because more people want to just take something with them so it just depends on the you know venue that I'm doing or what where I'm at but um yeah the the antler stuff sells better up there because the wire's a little bit bigger and I'd have to yeah and you have there. to I feel like buying art is something you're more in the mood that you set out for. As mm -hmm. like in the antlers, you might be able to just come across and think it's cool and take. Yeah, right. And that's pretty much the case. They can just take it with them. And, yep. and then you also create dog chews, right? Yeah, and those are, yeah, that's just uh, cutting up antlers. And the dogs love them. It's good for their teeth. Uh, it's been a real steady market. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of cutting them up, packaging them. I've got a few dealers. Um, you know, locally, uh, Bridger Feed sells them, Heaves, uh, you know, just, I've got a few. Uh, is it kind of like uh, you have a line where it's like, this antler is still in good shape, so it crafts, versus this is kind of, it's broken in these places, so it's kind of, yeah. here's the... Pretty much, and although I'm busy enough um, with the dog chew thing, I, I've cut up perfectly good antlers to, you know, it's it 
kind of stinks to yeah, cut up a great big elk like, antler, but when you need, you know, you got to get product out the door, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like, you hate cutting them up, but you have to sometimes, so, yeah. <laughs> great. And uh, is there any last thing that you want to talk about? Any last lessons? No, I think we covered a lot. That's, um, you know, pretty much my story, I think. <laughs> well, one last thing. So I always like to end with this question. It has been a tough year for obvious reasons, and right. it has knocked people off their creative flow. What's one way you've managed to stay creative, and what's one piece of advice that you give to artists struggling to refine that creativity? You know, yeah, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. I was a little nervous this summer, but, um, you know, I just kept after it, and sales are good. I actually, not doing the shows, like the Cowboy Christmas, you know, that was that was a big event for us for the, you know, money for the year, and... Um, I'm stocking up on inventory and you know, we're still getting by. So I'm just, just keeping at it and building stuff and it, it's going to, it'll come back around. So I'm, I'm, I've got a really good inventory of little things to, for next year. And I'm still trying to, you know, work on some new things and, um, keep busy. Do you feel though, without having to go to so many shows that you may have had a little less pressure, which allowed you to experiment more? Um, maybe, um, yeah, I um, like I, I, I've got a few projects lined up for you know the next this next month that I, I kind of want to get done, and looking forward. Actually, I'm kind of looking forward to having you know some time to do those and some of the ideas I got in my head. And, you know, like this sheep thing and you know horse. We'll see. You know, it's um, but you know I've sales have still been pretty good. I mean, it was a good year for Christmas sales for little things for um, you know off my website. So you know I've been lucky that way. Yeah, and what is your website? AntlerCreek.com. And is that the best way people can find you? Yeah, yeah. If they if they Google that or just go AntlerCreek.com, it'll pop up. Um, uh, yeah, so it it should be pretty easy to find. Thank you. And I actually, I thought of one last thing I want to talk to you about. So you have the most natural medium of any artist I've talked to. When you're out in nature, does that help your ideas come more easily if you're hunting or you're looking for the antlers? Or do your ideas form more when you're in the shop or before you even leave? You know, I guess I don't know that I've given that much thought. I just, um, I, I just like hiking and picking up antlers. And um, and like I say, sometimes I find an antler and I go, oh, that's going to make an awesome table lamp or a, you know, like this. It's like, oh, that's a cool moose. You know, I don't know. It's a little big for a table lamp, but... You know, it might look good just by my fireplace, and it's um. So you know, it's I don't know. It's just it's fun being out there, and that's. And what, what about the me. season? Does the season affect your creativity at all? Because you might be more out in the summer versus the well, winter. Well, you know, the you, shed antlers, you're pretty much looking for them in the spring, you know, or late winter. You know, whitetail start shedding here real soon. Uh, elk won't be till you know late March, April. Um, although the moose shed here real soon too. I'm gonna go maybe look for. This guy again. Hopefully, he got bigger. And Did Find moose start shedding? Yeah, he started. The actually, they like could be shedding right now. End of December, beginning. Yeah, end of, of December. January. Yeah, mid December through January, February. Do you get excited when you know it's shed season? Oh yeah, it's just like you're gonna have long yeah. material that's yeah. might come in. No, I love it. I, I'm, you know, and when the season ends, I'm thinking about next year already. It's like, oh, I got to go to that spot. I got to go to that spot, and it's, you know, it's yeah, it's so much fun. And you have you ever found an antler that's so unique, like so the shape that you get like super excited? Oh yeah, this could be something totally different. Yeah, you know, and just the way they lay when you you know when you see them in the woods and you see a little tip sticking up and yeah, you know, I've been I take a lot of pictures. So that video of the as they lay, I put some unique ones on there, and it's just you know it's fun to you know when you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden there's an antler laying there. All these years later, do you think you still get as excited? Oh yeah, it's still a treasure hunt. It's you still, still a treasure hunt. Yeah, because you don't know if you're gonna yeah. come home at the end. And... Yep. Yeah, it's it's still. I mean, I, I, I probably enjoy picking up an antler more than shooting an elk. I mean, I've shot a lot of elk in my day, and I love hunting, bow hunting, but, um, you know, finding antlers is just as much fun for me. That's cool. Yeah. It's so cool how just, like, I mean, it's a total process. You go out and you enjoy the process of collecting material, then you get to enjoy the process of actually creating, and then you get to enjoy the process of selling. Yeah, the selling part's fun, too, because, you know, you're meeting a lot of people, and you get to talk with them and hear stories and... You know, it's and I, I kind of like that too. It's um, yeah, the whole process is fun. Yeah, and your story is like as a sculptor of natural materials. I think even more creative and a little bit more unique than a painter. Mm -hmm. Even though every painting 
has its own story. It's like actually going out to find the elk antler and then plays it together. Right. Is a little bit more unique than painting on oil or painting like yeah. painting on canvas. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could paint, but then I, I you know, I probably I might try that one day. Only so time. much time, yeah, right? Know, only so many hours in a day. So, but uh, yeah, that yeah, I did a lot of that when I was younger. But I just yeah, this stuff's fun. So, right. I think we'll leave it. Thank you so much, yeah. Brian. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Your time. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe, and check us out next week. All right. Thanks.